You know those times when you have recorded a video and you think everything is where it exactly needs to be? And then you go to edit and you find, I can't be out on the internet like that. <laughs> so I'm recording this again, several eons late. Welcome back to my channel. If this is the first time that you're seeing any of my videos, my name is Buon Dunji and this is Butterflies from Bees where we talk about books, we talk about writing, we talk about all kinds of things pertaining to stories and I'm so excited that you're here. Ah! To all the new subscribers, welcome. It is amazing to see your faces, returning subscribers. I love you, I really do. And to um, all those people who have not yet subscribed, you're missing out. Go ahead and subscribe right now while I finish the introduction of this thing. You know, just subscribe. It's very quick, just click the red button and it does it for you. In the last video, I discussed two of the stories that I read that were shortlisted for the Kane Prize. The very first one that I reviewed won. It ended up being the longest video simply because I had so much to say about that story. And maybe that should have been a hint, but anyway, I did not guess right. But since I have not yet reviewed the last two stories, I'm going to do that right now. Did you subscribe yet? And then we will be done with the Kane Price stories and can get back to the business of writing. Not that this isn't writing, you know, we talk about what we learned with all the stories. So My Mouth is the first one that I'm going to talk about, written by Cherry Candy. She wrote a story about lesbian love and the complications of living a lie, especially when the community comes around, parents, when they're in public, and what they must do to hide their relationship from everyone. It also deals with the devastation of family abuse and the devastation of a family history that has created a human being who's supposed to be whole, but instead is very broken. And I'm going to read an excerpt for you. It is my second favorite paragraph. The last page is really my favorite part of the story. It's full of symbolism and is completely an amazing experience to read, especially after you've read the story. It is perhaps a matter of weather in relation to climate. The weather is mercurial. In the morning, it wants pink lipstick, and by noon it has decided that today is a red lipstick day. Some days it ties its arms around me, and other days it cannot meet my eyes. If the weather is a yellow banana peel racked with black scars, then the climate is what is inside. It is the way Magda squeezes my hand under tables when I have sewn my mouth so tightly that I can hardly breathe. It is the certainty that is the great big engine that is her heart how it runs on butter and baringo honey, and how it warms me, melting open my stitches. Therefore, if a particular Nairobi November day appears sunny from inside the house, then what do we say to someone who goes out to the salon to flat iron their hair, expecting that the straightness will last for at least a week and a half, and then does not have an umbrella in their bag on the very day that the rain decides to come the way Jesus said he would? kinking their expensive straightness. Is the coming of the rain in Nairobi in November expected or unexpected? We can say, yes, it is your fault. The rain was expected. This is November. Why didn't you have an umbrella? You just go home and style your afro. We can also collect in a corner and decide that no, it's not your fault. The rain was unexpected. It has been sunny for the whole week. Imagine it only decided to rain once you stepped out of the salon. Polisana, let us curse heaven together. There are things that are both expected and unexpected. And the rain is one of these things. Best like, and I don't know whether it's my affinity for symbolism, but I really love these two paragraphs. This is a difficult story. It is the story of two people who are struggling to be together. Each one is traumatized and they, yet they want to be together in a place that cannot accept their love with people who cannot accept their relationship. And so when other people are around, they have to behave differently. And this is a story that is common if you go looking for stories of people who do not fit the cisgender heteronormative 
lifestyle. There are many people who are hiding their relationships. It's a painful thing to imagine. The first thing that I felt regarding this story has to do with how quilt bag stories are told, or if you're unfamiliar with that acronym, LGBTQ+. How those stories are told and the way in which we introduce severe trauma to these particular characters in order to humanize them so that those who object to love between people like that can keep their violence, whether it's by word or actions, away from these people. I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I understand we all have some kind of event that we believe to be traumatic in our histories, but oftentimes I find that these stories of LGBTQ plus people, they're so traumatized, it becomes like a trauma fest. Like, how traumatized can we make this particular person in order to explain what we perceive to be proclivities. And that is dangerous. I think it is dangerous to assume that. It makes a single story. And I understand that it exists. On the one hand, I want the stories to exist. On the other hand, I'm thirsty. That is the word I wanted. I'm thirsty for stories of people who were boring normal and then they grew into their gayness. The second thing that I wanted to talk about is something that Baden and I often talk about. For many families in the different generations, people are trying to do better than they believe their parents did for them. So if their parents did not spare the rod, then they will spare the rod or vice versa. If their parents didn't take them to public school, then they will take their children to public school because they believe that that is better. And it doesn't always mean that the choices that they're making are better for the children, that oftentimes that is what they're trying to do, to make lives for their children better because they want what's best for their kids. Please don't get me wrong. I know that there are parents out there who don't have those feelings at all, who are indifferent to their children, have abandoned them or have been cruel and abusive. It is an interesting thing to look at someone's life look at the choices that they have made for their own children. You get to understand the choices they have made once you look at how their parents treated them. The last thing has to do with the source of trauma in a life, especially when that source of trauma is also the only source of comfort that you've ever known and the tendency that human beings have to return to that source, regardless of the abuse of the trauma experienced before, because this is the only place where the comfort that you will get will be something that with which you are familiar. The first thing that I learned from this story is the passage of time and how she marked it in her story. Whenever I'm reading the story, I'm curious about how much time has passed. So in the morning, on Sunday, it was an interesting experience to sort of also draw your own conclusions about how much time has passed. And I wondered how that would work for my own story. But I know what I crave. <laughs> I crave to know when exactly this happened, who did it, why they did it, then we can move on. <laughs> and using first person narrative, if you do not have a skilled writer, a skilled storyteller, them flashing back into their memory or talking about the scene, the world in which they exist can make the story feel broken up into little parts. And I realized that for my current work in progress, I had done a particularly major info dump and had not flowed well enough from the character speaking their thoughts to the flashback to the history of the world. And so that is something which I'm going to have to work on. The last thing that I learned from this story is learning to be unafraid of using phrases or expressions that are not necessarily familiar to the majority of people who are going to be reading your book. The reason why we learn new turns of phrases is because somebody comes up with them and then we all start using it. The danger of a single story from Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie or other countless things that you can come up with. For example, in this story, we have my daughters, my daughters. Another person would have thought that she loved me like a daughter, but I had known otherwise. I had known because I had learned to unearth true intentions, gleaning them like long translucent bones buried deep within tilapia fish. A lot of people that I have met in my experience away from Africa is that there are many people who don't have the experience of being served an entire fish. A fish with its head and tail and fins and bones, everything. You are supposed to eat this piece of meat and take the bones out yourself. And I have a clear memory, as clear as day, 
of having one of the long bones and I'm taking the meat off. So I understand it because I've had the experience of it. But what about people who have it? Because these cane prize stories are not being told for an African audience. This prize is for an English audience. And how many people there have actually eaten a whole fish? or know what it means to suck the meat out of the skull of a fish. In my own writing, with my own experiences, what is it that I can include? What phrases am I shying away from that would explain what it is that I mean but not necessarily be evident to everyone who reads it? I enjoyed the story immensely. Thank you, Candy Cherry. That was a great, tragic. This story was tragic. It was a hand-wringing experience, and I think you need to have it as well. The links to the story will be in the description box below. Now it's time for the last story, the very last story of them all. The last story of the Kane Price stories. I don't know why I kept it to the last, but now it is the last. All our lives, the second story in this video is going to be All Our Lives by Okafor Tochukwu from Nigeria. What an unexpected story this was. This story was quite unexpected. I wasn't ready for the experience of it, but I'm glad that I did actually have the experience of it and read it. Go ahead and read it. This story is a story that we're all familiar with because we know someone or we have experienced it ourselves of a grand exodus from small towns or rural areas to the big city to find fame and fortune. And this particular story is different than anything I had read before. And I love, love the experimentation of it. And sometimes it was a direct telling of a story and other times it had more metaphorical elements. So I'm going to read a short excerpt for you to kind of let you know what the experience was like for me. Each morning before leaving our workplaces and each evening before bedtime, we gaze into the mirror and touch our faces, thinking of ourselves as ugly, pimply, handsome, beautiful, our noses are like those of our ancestors, bulbous, pinched in the corners, fat, aquiline, straight, or scarred. We braid our hair into dreadlocks or in neat cornrows, or we leave our hair to grow into afros. We are bald. We crop our hair low. Our hair is unkempt, tufts of foam with lice nesting in them. We are black. We are not black. We bleach our skin. We refuse to bleach our skin since we toil under the sun. We do not want the heat to scald us, leaving patches of red here and streaks of black there. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> do you see how this story is told? Anyway, we'll talk about it and what I learned about writing, but first of all, let's talk about how I felt about the story and the conversations because ha, there were some things that came up in here that needed to be said. First of all, how many of us have gotten those Nigerian prince emails? And how many people have actually fallen for it? Some people are still falling for those scams because they are alive and well. I did actually once have a conversation with somebody who had told me he was a prince from some tribe. And I said, you know what? You're not going to deceive me. I'm up on the, you know, I know what's going on. So, and you know what he told me? Let's scam these people. Who can I send my email to? I was like, dude, I'm not doing something illegal. The sophistication of some of these scams is quite interesting. And it has switched from sort of send me your bank account number to having relationships with people. And some people may view this as immoral. Some people may view this as an opportunity for them to experience something different than they have experienced before. The second thing is about human sexuality and the ways in which we will explain stuff away so that we can fit what society demands that people ought to be. At the end of the story, here's a paragraph that actually quite surprised me. Some of us encounter a different kind of love and the city tries to lynch us. A cyber cafe manager has caught us visiting sites where men seek love from their fellow men. Men kissing men, one sucking another's manhood, each taking turns to ply themselves from behind. 
At first, we are disgusted. Our minds scream abomination. We wonder how a man can find joy in another man's body. How unnatural it is that the love between them is consummated through the small hole where shit exits the body. We don't understand this kind of love. We are confused when our bodies begin to respond to such passions, longing to be explored by men. We imagine men's lips crushing against ours. We imagine being held at night. We yearn for this different kind of love. This conversation about human sexuality is important because we don't talk about it, we don't think about it, it doesn't occur in pop culture, you won't find it in any books or any of the books that I have read. There's this popular notion that men have never looked at other men's bodies and that's not what they're interested in and they've never done that and so on and so forth. And then you find out about something called a circle jerk, which is when men gather together in one place, they may watch uh, some porn and they pleasure themselves or they engage in what we would term as homosexual interactions and they would not call themselves homosexual men they would not even say that that encounter had been homosexual and i know it was popularized back when oprah was like oh, the down low people on the down low and that's how it's getting to black women i know it was popularized but this is a conversation that is important it's not a bad thing it's just we have to understand ourselves better. What then is human male sexuality? We don't know, we don't have a clear picture because we won't talk about it. Won't talk about the fact that men are having sex with each other when they're young, when they cannot find girls to have sex with, or simply because they just want to have sex with men, or simply because they were in a circle jerk and the opportunity presented itself. Will we ever know? I don't know, but it's an important conversation to have in order to understand ourselves better. The last thing that I wanted to talk about was this whole idea of what it means to have left what is considered a more rural life to live a life of greater sophistication. My own parents did it. They moved from the places in which they were born and they went to the city and they had city jobs and, you know, lived a city life. And so it was foreign to my grandparents who they themselves had moved from their parents and they seemed sophisticated. And I have moved away from home. And so there's this whole conversation about what it means to constantly look for that place where things are going to be better, possibly. And I think I had mentioned this before in a previous video, but this idea of what it means to be an African with an expectation of the continuation of African culture, of African language, once you have moved from one place to another. What did I learn about writing from this story, a story, a story? What did I learn about writing from this story? Number one, this story doesn't have an MC. It does not have a main character. That was so puzzling to me when I first landed on the story and was like, we this and we that. We are this, we are this, we are this. We are handsome, we're ugly, we're short, we're fat. It's a description of a large group of people as opposed to just one particular individual's experience. That was curious to me. I think I want to experiment with it. I'm not quite sure how. And if you are part of the Wednesday lunchtime write-in, you will find a lot of my experimentation happening there. So if you've not attended, please plan to attend one Wednesday at lunchtime. I do it at 12.30 Eastern Standard Time. And I've experimented with a story that had only dialogue. And I've experimented with a story that had absolutely no dialogue. So I'm interested in this experimentation of storytelling. I cannot imagine a novel length story being told this way, but you know what? Anything can happen, anything can happen. Imagine encompassing the stories of a large group of people, like all the people who are moving from a rural area. Like this did not have to be a story about Africans moving from the village to the city. It could have been the story of people moving from some rural area in the countryside in Russia and, and going to Moscow or somebody in the farms in China moving to Shanghai. You, it could have been any place in this world and it would have encompassed the experience of all of them. What do you do with your bodies? Where do you live? How do you survive? When you don't make it, what happens? What is your experience as a human being in a bustling city 
that has more energy than the place that you came from. It was a very curious experiment and I loved it. I loved it for that. Go ahead and read the story for yourself. The links will be in the description box below. If instead of reading the story, you would like to listen to it, there are audio files for each one of these stories and I've put them in the description boxes. So you can listen to them on SoundCloud for free. Somebody else can read them for you while you do something else. I love audiobooks. Anyway, I do have to say that I have enjoyed thinking about these stories, reading them, talking about what I think about these stories with other people, the different challenges that it brings to me as a writer. I've really enjoyed going through these stories and I'm grateful once again for the Kane Prize and its existence. Because without it, we wouldn't have these plethora of conversations. We'd instead be doing something else and there are tons of things to do. <sighs> like finish my sock laundry. <laughs> we get to do this again next year and hopefully, 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 I won't be sort of as mentally confused as I have been in the last few weeks. Thank you so much for being here again. Let me know what you thought about these stories, especially the one with the, um, with the experimentation and writing and which of these stories you liked the best. And if you haven't read all of them, that's okay too. You can listen to them on SoundCloud. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel because there are videos coming up all the time. I do live events two times a week. Monday morning writing, Wednesday prompt writing exercise, and then I try to get another video out during the week. Like the video and I will see you next time when we talk about, I'm not sure what yet, but we are going to talk about it and it will be about writing and storytelling. Thank you so much for being here. Take care of yourselves. Bye.